we've covered in the first half the basics, and now we're going to get on to some of the more media topics. Um, so the next thing to look at is mixed language debugging, so C or C++ with Python. And I think there was some interest from people to see this. So <clears throat> what we see amongst our customer base is an increased usage um, of Python, particularly to call out to applications that are written in C or C++. And that's predominantly to provide access to high performance routines and to leverage existing algorithms and libraries. And there's lots of different frameworks available for writing mixed language applications such as Swig, C types, PyBind, um, Cython, et cetera. So we currently support Swig, uh, C types, and PyBind. And we know that um, debugging mixed language applications is not easy because debugging a single language is difficult enough. It's important to be able to understand the flow of execution across language barriers and to be able to examine and compare data in both languages. But what TotalView provides you with is an easy Python debugging session setup. We give you uh, the fully integrated Python and C++ call stack, and we remove what we call the glue layers. So these are the additional stack frames um, that aren't the uh, C and the Python language um, stack frames. So we remove the additional stack frames, giving you a very nice, clean user interface. You can easily compare and contrast the variables in Python and C++. And it, it only requires uh, modest system requirements. You can also utilize um, re reverse debugging, replay engine, and memory debugging um, if you need to do so. And we support Python 2.7 and above, and Python 3.0 and above. So, this is a, a screenshot of debugging um, a Python uh, and the C++ application. Over here on the right, you can see the call stack. And this is what we mean by the glue code. These are all of the extra stack frames. And what we do is we uh, have the option to filter those frames. And then you can see here that it's a much nicer, uh, cleaner user interface, much easier to understand what's going on inside the application. So that's when we turn on filtering. So let's have a look at that in practice. I just need to go over to my virtual machine. And what I'm doing is I'm running TotalView and I'm providing as an argument to TotalView, Python 3.7, the debug uh, build. And the application we're going to be looking at is called testPythonTypes.py. And this is available for you within the Python um, um, directory that's that's in the examples that um, is provided with TotalView. So you can try this out for yourself. Um, or even though we don't have a particular tutorial, um, there are step-by-step -step instructions um, as to how to build this example and how to run it um, in the examples directory. So let's start this up. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to set a couple of action points. And I'm going to use the at location option. And I'm going to set the action points on two functions. One's called dot, and another one is called fact. So I'm going to create those two action points. And you can see they're down here in the bottom left. So we've got those uh, pending because TotalView hasn't yet loaded up. Uh, the Python uh, 3.7 debug framework. So when I press go, TotalView will start and it will load up the application. And you see those breakpoints are no longer pending. And in fact, we hit the first breakpoint here and we stop at this um, C example called fact, which uh, calculates factorial. So over here on the right hand side, we've got the call stack. 
And this was what I mentioned about all of the additional glue frames. You can see there's lots of stack frames displayed here. If I go up to this little filter, I can turn on filtering and then Total View will remove all of the additional glue frames, leaving just the um, Python and C++ module. So it's a nice way to navigate through your code. Um, if I go to the Python module, I can see here that I'm inside the Python module here and I'm calling the C fact function and I'm passing in a parameter A. I can see down here my local variables, I can see the value of A. And I can easily drag that over into the data view. So just to keep that in focus, if I go back up to the C++ fact function, again, we're taking in a parameter um, for the um, function. We're taking in a parameter N. And again, I can drag that over into the data view. We can just compare and contrast to make sure the values are indeed the same, which they obviously are. Um, you'll notice also that the Python variable here has a padlock next to it, which means that it's read only. So I can't change this. Even if I double click on it, I can't change that. If I can change the C variable though, if I wanted to, I could change that to another value. So let me just remove both of those from the data view. I'm going to um, uncheck the uh, breakpoint here because I want to move on to the next breakpoint. So I'm going to carry on debugging, pressing go. And now we run to the next breakpoint, which is inside the dot function. And the dot function calculates the dot product of two matrices. So if I have a look in the Python module, I can see here that it's taking in two NumPy arrays, X and Y, and it's calculating the dot products of those matrices. If I want to have a look at the X array, I can just drag this over here into the data view. I can expand this out and I can see the value of the array two, three, four, five, and six. And if I want to see the same value of the um, array that's being passed into the um, C function. So here inside the um, function, we're taking in a, an integer, a pointer to a long, another integer and another pointer to a long. So if I want to have a look at the array, it's the pointer that I want to drag over here. And if I expand that, we can see the first value of the array is two. And then I can easily cast that to an, a pointer to an array of size five. And if I do that, then total view displays the whole array for me. So we can see the whole array, two, three, four, five, six. So this is, um, this is the, um, Python debugging support that we have currently. And uh, I think you'll agree that um, it's, um, it's very useful in that you can easily um, transform the, the stack frame and you can compare and contrast the variables very nicely. Let me just stop this and exit out from here. Um, did we have some questions about Python? Uh, nothing coming up on chat about Python. Uh, okay. Dean, so. any, anyone have any questions about the Python debugging support? Just give it a minute or two. No? Okay. Oh, something popped. Uh, so this question there, and Dean about MPI for Pi um, work as well. So um, I have run uh, Total View against uh, MPI applications written like the MPI for Pi on there. Um, Total View, of course, will follow through the MPI launch correctly, and everything it will acquire the uh, Python. Um, interpreters as they are launched across uh, different nodes and cores and so forth. And uh, and then uh, everything that you saw what Dean demoed, demonstrated on there and setting the breakpoints into the C and C++ uh, Python modules that are loaded into Python works um, as you can, uh, as we showed here. So um, you gotta make sure that everything is kind of all set up. So total view follows correctly through, but then it will acquire and, and allow you to do the debug just like we showed. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill.
All right, so the next topic that we're going to cover is reverse debugging with Replay Engine. And uh, reverse debugging is a really nice feature. Um, so without reverse debugging, if you had an intermittent failure, you'd probably do something like setting a breakpoint, realizing you'd run past it, reloading the application, setting the breakpoint a bit higher up, and then hoping that you catch the, the problem or that it fails. And you basically repeat until you know you narrow down the, the problem. Um, with Replay Engine, you can set a breakpoint, you can start recording, you can see the failure, and you can run backwards and forwards within the context of the failing execution. So it's a really nice feature. And um, people that we've shown it to, you know, they just really appreciate how much time Replay Engine can save them. So <clears throat> when you're recording, um, Replay Engine, uh, when Replay Engine is saving the state, it's in record mode. And it saves the uh, state information. <laughs> Sorry, the saved state information is, is the program's execution history. Um, you can save the execution history at any time, and you can reload the recording when debugging the executable in a subsequent session. Um, so using Replay Engine, either from the toolbar or the command line shifts replay engine into replay mode. So you're either in record mode or in replay mode. And there are certain commands that don't work in replay mode. Things such as changing a variable's value, <coughs> excuse me, functions that alter memory and running threads asynchronously. So the replay engine toolbar then, basically it's analogous to the um, normal total view toolbar. Over here on the left, you have the record button, you have the go back button, um, you have the previous button, unstep, uh, caller, you have the run back to button, um, you have the live button, which shifts from replay mode to record mode. So at any point during the session, you can go back to live mode. Um, you have a bookmark here, which enables you to create a replay engine bookmark at a selected location. And then you have the option of saving the recording session to a file, um, either for you to come back to at a later take or to um, share with um, one of your team members. So it facilitates collaboration in that sense. Um, you can save the replay engine execution to a file at any time, and you can load it up into TotalView. Um, and as we saw, that's the same page as where you would load the core file or the replay engine recording. Um, replay engine bookmarks allow you to jump to a particular point in the execution of the program quickly. So if you find a particular point in the code where um, there's an issue, you can easily bookmark that and then come back to that just by double clicking on the uh, replay engine bookmark. Um, you can set the preferences for Replay Engine. Um, if you're using the new user interface, you can uh, set the uh, maximum amount of memory that's available to Replay Engine by using the dset command. And you can also choose the preferred behavior. So by default, what happens is Replay Engine discards the oldest history. So it keeps a rolling buffer basically um, overwriting the oldest history so that the recording can continue. And you can change that. There's either mode one, which is discard the oldest history, or mode two, which means stop the process when the buffer is full. So let's have a look at a replay engine demo. So I'm just going to start totally view as normal. And I'm going to choose um, one of my recent sessions, which is replay engine demo. It's telling me that the action point has changed a particular line. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set a breakpoint inside the main function here at line 25. And I'm going to turn on replay engine recording. Now, you can turn replay engine recording on either from the beginning of your debugging session, or if you've got a lot of um, initialization or a long running program, you can uh, run to a breakpoint and then you can turn replay engine on from the breakpoint. So um, you don't need to record a lot of history if it's, if it's not particularly relevant. In this case, I'm gonna turn the recording on now and we can confirm that the re replay engine is enabled by checking from the debug menu. You can see that checkbox there. So when I press go, we run to the first breakpoint. So we stop here at the breakpoint. And now you can see the replay engine recording buttons are active. So these are highlighted now because I've turned on replay engine recording. And I can step into uh, the function. So now I'm inside the function A and I can navigate forwards as I would do normally. And because replay engine's turned on, I can also go backwards as well. So I can navigate backwards and I could even go out to the caller function as well. Um, if I carry on debugging this particular application, it crashes and we can see that we've got a segmentation violation here. Um, we've got nothing in the call stack, no local variables. So normally what we would have to do is restart our application, try and um, guess where the problem occurs, set some breakpoints, and then step through the code. If that doesn't work, set the breakpoints a bit earlier and so on. And as you can see, it's an iterative process. But because we've got replay engine recording turned on, I can simply click on unstep, which takes me back into my application. I can select a line of code here at line 50, and then I can choose <clears throat> the run back to option. So I can execute all of those lines back to line 50. Now over here on the right hand side, I can see uh, my call stack. So I can navigate up my call stack and I can see that local variables are displayed as well. So we can start to investigate exactly what's happened in this particular application. And the last thing that happens inside this application is we're writing to an array inside a for loop. And the array V, if I hover over that, um, total view tells me that it's array of integers and it's of size 20. So uh, we're writing to it array length number of times and that's 100. Immediately that looks suspicious. What we're writing 100 elements to an array that was only ever designed to hold 20. So in order to investigate that a bit more, <clears throat> I can right click on array length and I can add it to data view. So now it's in the data view down here, we can see the value is 100. I can create a watch point on that array length. And if I have a look over here at my action points, I've got the first break point here, which we set. And I've also got a watch point on array length. So um, total view is going to tell me when the value stored in array length was changed. If I carry on running backwards, now we hit the uh, watch point and we can see that visually because it's highlighted in yellow. Also from the command line, I can see here, it tells me it's hit the watch point. And this was where the value stored in array length was last changed. So it was originally 20. And then inside this function here, someone's changed it to be equal to five times the value of max depth, which is defined higher up the program. So immediately um, we can see where the problem has occurred. I can also create a replay engine bookmark. So if I click on this, I can call it something like error location. And then that's uh, now appears in the replay engine bookmarks tab down at the bottom. And if I was to carry on running backwards through the application, we run back and we hit the first breakpoint that we set originally. If I want to go back to the um, location of the error, I can just double click on this replay engine bookmark and it takes me right back there. So it's a, a really nice way of navigating around our program. And then the last thing to mention is if I want to save the replay engine recording, I can click on the save button and I can save this to disk and then I can share this with other people or I can come back to this at a later point. So that can save the entire replay engine recording. So that's um, our replay engine.
Does anybody have any questions? How are we doing on the chat? Let's see. So we had a few questions still about RDC, a couple about Python and our support there. Um, I did answer a question about Conda's uh, support in there just for others, um, just to clarify. So Conda is a great package, uh, really does provide a lot of capabilities for Python. Um, but we found that Conda does not distribute the um, uh, some of the debug information that is required by TotalView and also GDB because GDB has a level of Python debugging within it as well uh, yeah. to understand the state of your script and everything. Um, so they used to do this in a previous version in their latest versions, they chose not to distribute that. Um, so I, we haven't found a way to work around that. Packages like nThought, uh, the ones on systems and whatever do contain all the information. You can also build Python yourself. So uh, unfortunately there's a bit of limitation on Conda though. Okay. All right. So do you want me to take over from here, Dean? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to hand control over to you. So I'm going to stop sharing and people can have a rest from my voice. And, uh... All right. So let's see if I can do this correctly. I can share desktop too. And we'll move beyond. Let's see, we'll go over to here. Okay, uh, so that's a lot of information about Python debugging and reverse debugging. Um, uh, thanks, Dean, for going through all of that. Uh, one thing I'll just note on the reverse debugging is it is per process. So if you do need um, to, if you're debugging a parallel job and you want to do reverse debugging on a particular rank on there, you can stop and focus on that rank and enable and turn on reverse debugging. Um, you don't have to do it from the beginning of a program. You can do it at any point during the execution. Uh, often we'll find, um, and, and I'm sorry if you re if you said this, Dean, I repeat it, but um, if you have a, a lot of setup in the beginning of your application and you don't want to record that, it, there is a slowdown when you do the reverse, um, reverse debugging. Set a breakpoint beyond there, hit that breakpoint, and then turn on the reverse debugging. Um, and then you can begin to focus on the code that you want to record that history on, uh, on there anyway. OK, so let's talk um, a bit. I'm going to kind of meld two sections together here with demos. Um, I'm going to um, talk about total view support of OpenMP uh, applications. And uh, I'm going to do a demo of debugging actually a hybrid application that is OpenMP and MPI um, and talk about some of TotalView's latest features there. Um, and then I'm going to do um, a little more discussion around MPI debugging and I'll run an MPI example on Cori um, and show you again how the remote UI and TV Connect uh, works together to um, establish a uh, debugging session in that fashion there. So, um, so let's start with OpenMP first. So TotalView does support OpenMP. Um, OpenMP is a library of extensions that are delivered by compiler vendors. It's a, there is a standard out there that defines what the library and the interface is, including the internal structures that are there for tools like debuggers to be able to read the state of an OpenMP application, the threads that are launched, uh, the variables that are specific to OpenMP threads, the tasks and regions and so forth. Um, and that is what the debugger uses to to help you get a more specific um, view of an OpenMP application versus, say, just a regular pthreads application. Uh, this is part of what OpenMP gives you as a framework on there. Uh, so total view understands that on there, um, there is a latest version of the spec, actually 5.1 was just announced at supercomputing. Uh, version 5 of, of OpenMP totally revamped the debugging interface and it gave a lot more capabilities for the debugger to understand the threads that are launched and threads that launch other threads, threads that are organized into parallel regions. And it can then use that information to provide you a better picture of what your application is doing. And this is how you as a developer are thinking about the application and how you're launching different um, tasks that are to be run, how threat tasks may spawn other tasks and so forth. So um, now one, one of the things just to note there is, the version five and 5.1 especially, um, those capabilities 
are just coming out in some of the compilers. So Clang has a module that you can compile yourself um, and provides all the functionality. And I'm gonna demonstrate on that latest version of Clang compiled with um, support for OpenMP5. Uh, Intel compiler, I believe is coming out with it and has portions of it in place. Um, so TotalView is kind of ahead a little bit of where some of the compilers are. And as the compilers catch up on version five, we'll be qualifying TotalView against uh, their implementations. It is an API. It, they should have a standard way of us of being followed. So TotalView should work with it pretty easily, but you always have to test with them because sometimes things just don't work the way you, you want on there. Um, and of course, TotalView supports previous versions, version four and, and older implementations of OpenMP, um, but they, they weren't as rich on what the debugger could fetch for information out of there. So, um, so let me jump ahead. Actually, I'm gonna jump into a demo here um, and we can see how some of the OpenMP threads and so forth uh, run. So let me, um, I'm gonna do two different things on here. So let me start TotalView again. And get that onto the shared screen. Okay, so that came up okay here. Okay, so again, I'm running TotalView on, on my Mac. And um, the system I need to run on is actually back in my data center. Uh, again, I'm in Massachusetts. My data center is in Colorado. And I have predefined uh, a configuration that goes to a system named uh, Microwave uh, 1. So it's um, going to establish a connection through. I have SSH keys set up to that system, so it just automatically connected through out there. And um, uh, we can see again that now I'm out debugging on a Linux system from my Mac. Now um, I'm going to leverage uh, again. Let me close the old version of TotalView. And I'm going to leverage that TV connect mechanism that I talked about earlier. And um, so now I'm, I'm switched over to just a window that goes out to microwave one. And I'm going to run TV connect in front of a typical way that I run this hybrid application. I'm just using MPI run. I'm going to launch four ranks. Uh, on this system here, I'm just going to say oversubscribe on there because I may exceed the number of um, processes on our uh, cores in the system. And I'm going to run an application. It's a hybrid application that computes Fibonacci on here. So once I run this back in TotalView, TotalView is going to get that request now to say, do you want to establish this remote debugging session? So let's say yes. Okay. So TotalView is MPI run. We don't have the source for MPI run, so there's no source available. So let's start running here and TotalView will launch MPI run, which will then go through and launch the parallel job. And TotalView will ask him, do you want to stop so I can set breakpoints? So let's say yes. Okay, so now what we have here is my source for my application hybrid fib cpp at the top here and i have the opportunity before anything is run that i can go through and set breakpoints so i can set a breakpoint say on line 15 and like dean had showed here's our action points pane with those breakpoints um, <clears throat> by default total of you will instruct each process and only the process to stop at that location. So when I run this, each of the ranks is gonna come in here as they're computing Fibonacci and um, they are going to stop at this breakpoint. So let's let things run and we're gonna hit go on the entire group, which lets all of the ranks run through. And we can see I'm sitting at breakpoint on this one here. And if I look to the left, here's our process and threads view that Dean had described before. And right now I have this configured. So if I bring up the options panel down below, it's going to aggregate based on the share group, which is all of the executables with the same image, which happens to be all of them here. They're running all hybrid fib, uh, same program. The host name, it all be the same here. So that's not gonna be that interesting. The process state, and let's turn on a thread state here because we're dealing with OpenMP. And then down to function, if I wanted to, I could even look at the source line that we're aggregating on. So now let's close this panel and we can take a look here that I have four threads that are sitting at line 15 
at a breakpoint from my application. There's a number of other threads that happen to be part of OpenMP um, and even OpenMPI and whatever is on here um, that are just stopped in wherever because the applications are stopped on this. I can refocus by double clicking on any of these ranks and we see that they are all sitting at line uh, 15 at this point. I can control individual processes. So instead of issuing a command across the whole group, I can go to an individual process and I can step that process. So now I can move that through and you can see actually that that went into a pragma at line 21. And that pragma, which is OpenMP code, ended up with another set of calls into Fibonacci here. And that's what jumped us back into this breakpoint again. So at a high level, I can see what's going on with my ranks in my processes. But within uh, Total View now, under uh, to bring up the view, there's a new view called OpenMP. And if I open up that view on here, we have four tabs within that view that begin to give us information about the different parallel regions and task regions that are being hit here. So I'm going to let everything run a couple times here as we hit these breakpoints and let some of these tasks and regions develop here. And what we can see down below is as this Fibonacci routine is recursively called into by different tasks, uh, MPI tasks and OpenMP tasks in here that we see the relationships that are occurring. So now in this tree, we have our task regions. And as I click on these, it will, if I double click on it, it'll bring me to that task that was launched that's doing work. And that task spawned another task, happened to be at those same lines where breakpoints were hit and tasks were launched. And then we can see another one at 24. So now, this relationship is what OpenMP version 5 allows us to draw out for, uh, for the developers. And we couldn't do this in prior versions of OpenMP before. Um, so this is a big advancement for OpenMP developers. And um, if, I've got fairly simple parallel regions here. I only have one, but if you had more complex parallel regions, you would see those as well. There's more information that we can gather here. Um, about the OpenMP configuration. So if I look at the control variables, uh, this will give us information about versions. The, uh, just a lot of internal information that the OpenMP library is using as part of its configuration. Uh, and, and some of this will come down to how it was built. And uh, so this will give you those details there so you can understand what's influencing behavior of the application. And then uh, here um, we can show you the actual library and API version information. So this is part of LLVM OpenMP version five and uh, TR62 is the build and the actual library that is coming from on there. And then lastly, we can look at across each of these ranks here, the different threads that exist and the regions that they are in. So it's a different way of navigating specific to OpenMP that we can look at here to get into any of the regions um, that may be going on here. And I can double click, I believe I can double click on any of these to refocus. Let me try here. I thought there was, maybe I'm driving that wrong on there to get into those different regions. So now the other thing I'll point out The other thing that I'll point out in the right hand area is the call stack. So the call stack now will also show an integration of where you may have gone from one task into another task. And what it'll do is show you a frame where they are linked together. And if I click on that link frame, um, it will, you know, you can see here, it should be bring me to that point here at line 24. Let me go up. So I can click on a frame up above it, and this is the task region that it went into as it went from one thread into the next thread and it called through. So this kind of gives you a sequence calling from the execution that went, went through one OMP thread task region into another as it spawned through. And then uh, if you were in a lower area, let me see if I can get a thread. I may not have any in this particular state. 
there's ways that you can navigate up through. Um, there's a final link frame that would allow you to click up back through to a collar frame. And I don't think I have any in that particular state right now. Yeah, it's just that link and we refocus. Yeah, so I don't have any in that state, but uh, the, the call stack would show a final link frame. And if I click that, it would bring me back to the parent on there as well. Okay, so let me think if there's anything I've kind of missed on the OpenMP. This is straight on a CPU. Uh, the One of the other major goals of OpenMP5 is to support launching tasks into a GPU and of course making it much easier to do work on the GPU there. Um, there's still work that's being done on the interface, uh, the API side for OpenMP, and then of course the implementations of the compiler vendors for launching code and tasks under the GPUs. But the ultimate goal eventually will be, you will see threads that are running on a GPU and TotalView would show them over on the left and where you are in that code, um, just the same as we see here, threads that are running on a CPU. Okay, so let me... Um... See if there's any any questions so far, any chat that's come up um, on there. Let's see if chat messages. So uh, nope, nothing nothing new on chat. So any questions on OpenMP? I know I had one earlier, somebody already trying um, to do TotalView on an MPI, OpenMP application with Open, uh, OpenACC as well. Uh, so hopefully this demo shows you some of the capabilities of what TotalView can do in this space. Okay, uh, so let's now move on um, to talk about we're going to just basically extend what we were just looking at here, but to do it from a parallel um, standpoint. And uh, and then this demo here, I actually will uh, do the demo from launching a parallel job on Corey. So let me just clean up a few things here as I prepare for that. I'm going to just exit out of my total view. Go out of that. <clears throat> Okay, so for the parallel applications, we've already seen here a case where um, I've launched a hybrid application. Of course, it's MPI and OpenMP together. Um, and, and we've seen how TotalV has the ability to sim simultaneously debug uh, many threads and processes at a time. The process and thread view that I showed on the left, that becomes a critical view for you to understand what's happening in your parallel job. You have the control over how to aggregate that view. And when I bring total view up again, I'll show you that there's three different views that you can store in there. So maybe in one view, you have a uh, rank oriented type of view and the information that you aggregate by is specific to ranks. And then maybe in another one, you have a thread oriented view and you can change the attributes again for that so that um, uh, threads uh, information is important, uh, is shown there. And um, and that yeah, it looks like uh, Wusun mentioned that the example there, yeah, that example, um, uh, the hybrid Fibonacci is uh, one that I have uh, that I created on there. It's not in our samples. Um, I don't see any reason why I couldn't share that with you as well for the code. This it actually was derived from several of our MPI and OpenMP examples that I kind of put together to create the hybrid example. So let me make a note of that to support, provide that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, and then um, and then we've seen here already about the support for MPI, OpenMP, fork exec as well. If you have uh, using those mechanisms to launch multiple processes, and then different flavors of of threading that you might be using. Okay. So. As Dean showed earlier, um, there's several ways of launching a parallel job within TotalView. There is, within the user interface, the parallel session dialog. And this is an easy way to get started. Um, you can provide the application that you're going to run in parallel, any arguments to the application. 
on the left side, you can then select your parallel system that you're going to be using, the number of tasks, and any additional starter arguments that go there. There's a number of different flavors of MPI uh, parallel systems that we have pre-configured and um, for an environment. Well, one thing I'll note on here is the mechanism, um, uh, the mechanism that's used to launch this style of parallel job uh, is a little more forgiving of the environment. It does some investigation around, but because of that, it doesn't scale as well. This is good for smaller scale type of application. It's just not gonna leverage the efficiencies that um, say MPI run or S run or others will give as it launches up a parallel application. So I usually kind of, it's, it's an okay place to start, but I'll steer people away from this pretty quickly. And we'll look at some alternate ways um, through either your batch script um, or the command line to launch a parallel job. In both of those cases, you're going to leverage the efficiencies of your parallel system to launch a high scale job. And then total view kind of piggybacks on that to get control of the job, allow you to set breakpoints and then control the different ranks that are going through. And so this slide here kind uh, shows some of those ways of launching that alternate way from the command line here. So um, if I go down to, um, uh, you can see some of the ones who slurm on here where we're doing total view and then the dash args or dash dash args on there um, allows you to provide a program and then arguments to the program that total view will then run. So here we're doing S, S run dash N16 and then uh, the argument, uh, the program to run. So what will happen is total view will run S run and then uh, piggyback along for the job to debug on there. These are fine with an environment that um, you maybe aren't doing some remote debugging on there. I'm going to show what the total view remote UI again, just because I think it works really well um, in the, the use cases now with remote clusters. So uh, let me move on. I'm going to go through some of these slides because we've actually seen a lot of this already. We've seen how to control the groups uh, of processes individual processes or threads through the, some of the demos that Dean has done and uh, what I just did in the OpenMP demo. Uh, call graph, I will just mention, this is something that still only exists in the classic UI. So if you're looking for a call graph of function calls through that go across ranks um, of the MPI jobs, um, that doesn't exist yet in the new UI. There are various preferences to control what total view does when your job launches. Um, so there's a couple on there. One, how should it attach? Uh, should you attach to everything from the beginning or do you individually attach to a process as it's running? Um, or, and also once you've attached, do you stop all the, um, all the ranks? I typically have it attached to everything and I have it stopped so I can set breakpoints and then I resume the job on my own. I, th I believe those are the defaults for a parallel job. A feature that will come into the new UI is uh, what's called subset attach. In the classic UI, if you say launched a large job of 1,024 ranks, you may only want to attach to a portion of that. And um, uh, with the classic UI, we show a list of all of those uh, ranks and you can choose which ones you want to attach to. And that will be coming into the new user interface. Message queues as well. So this is, if you do need to examine MPI message queues, um, we have a view in the classic UI. You can see this information through TotalView's command line interface, which is available in the new UI. So if you did need to investigate any of those, you could, um, and we'll be bringing this feature into the new UI. And lastly, on the message queue graph uh, as well, um, you can see uh, some of the ways that TotalView will track the messaging that's going through in the communicators there. And uh, this exists in the classic UI. So let me, um, let me just uh, talk through a couple techniques, just are good to have kind of in your back pocket as you are um, doing, um, debugging of multiple threads and deadlock situations and so forth. And this is where using some of the features of TotalView uh, together can help you solve a problem. So um, TotalView, when it displays threads, there's several different IDs that can be used. Several are at the operating system level. So you can have what's called the pthread library ID. And this is what's displayed by default in TotalView. 
but uh, and that's usually a big long number that identifies the thread. Um, operating systems will also use what's called a lightweight process or LWP ID. Um, so both of these will be displayed in total view and that can allow you to equate to that if you were looking at say top or other information in your system. Now at the highest level, total view does abstract and create its own what's called a process uh, and thread ID. It's a, a number, it's followed with a dot and another number. So you'll see like one dot three and you'll see that used predominantly. That's how you identify a process and a thread in total view. So you'll see that through the user interface. Um, it's just good to kind of know the differences on there um, and what the, um, what the debugger is showing. Uh, so one of the cases that I had found um, when using total view is as common as trying to find a deadlock case uh, when you're using mutexes. And um, when that happens, you can have several threads that have a mutex and they'll lock and unlock that to access a shared resource. And on Linux, uh, that mutex is a structure. And um, within that structure is um, a data element that holds the lightweight process ID or that lightweight thread ID of which one has the lock. Um, and one of the things that you can do is if you combine reverse debugging in the watch points capability is you can watch who owns that lock. And when that changes on there, the lock is granted from one thread to another. So I've had cases where um, I've been able to get to a deadlock situation under reverse debugging and I'll watch that particular field of a mutex and then start running backwards, just like Dean demonstrated with the reverse debugging engine until the point that it changes. And that, that's the point that you, you were granted the lock for the mutex. So you can start to understand, you know, you need to understand a bit about how mutexes work in the data structure there, but then you combine in reverse debugging capabilities and watch point capabilities of the debugger to then analyze the point that that state changes and a lock is granted or released. And then from there, you can start to determine how your program got to that state. Okay, recursion. And I think uh, there's several other techniques on here. Um, I think I've talked about each of these as well. Yeah. Okay, so let me do one more demo here. Um, I'm gonna actually do a different demo. This, uh, it, it's not gonna be extensive demo. It's more to launch an MPI application. And again, we'll see how um, that looks under total view within the Cori system though. So let me go back and um, I'm gonna probably have to reestablish what I have out in uh, open timed out here. Yeah, I do. So I'm going to have to log into Quarry again. Okay, so I'm going to start Total View again, running on my Mac. And I'm going to establish a connection out to Quarry again um, on the login. So I have to log in. Again, this is in uh, just a different window here. So give me a second as I enter my information that's needed. And my OTP, I'm going to do this one more time. So. Okay, so I am, if we look at my command line, I'm connected again now to Linux and um, uh, in the lower right in the status bar, it says my remote session is cori.nurse.go. So I'm connected there to the system. And now um, I'm going to, log in manually um, to another place where I'm going to submit a, a batch job. So again, I have to do this one more time. Okay, so now I am there. Okay, so let me um, go into my demo directory and Directory called Prime Count. Okay, and so here um, I have a Slurm script 
it's going to submit a job on here. It's going to do a module load open MPI. Um, I, I, I need to remove this statement. I originally installed my own total view um, just to make sure things were working. All you need to do is module load total view before here, and I need to replace that, but I'll leave it for now. And I have put in front of my S run the TV connect command on here. So let's um, just do uh, a submission of this as we would normally do. I don't know, hopefully it doesn't take too long to get an allocation to run this. And we will submit this on here. And as the system goes through the queue, what we will see is that all of you will then get the request to say, do you want to accept this connection? So we can say yes. And now we can see S run, total view is in control of that. And I'm going to begin running my parallel job. And in a moment here, total view asks us, do we want to stop the job so I can set breakpoints? So let's say yes. And so at this point, everything's being launched by S run, total view is getting control of it. And then um, you end up hitting, um, uh, then you end up hitting a, uh, a magic breakpoint within uh, the way that the MPI applications are launched. And nothing has really begun running here, but we have my application and I can go through and set breakpoints in here. So uh, I've got a routine that's just counting prime numbers on here. So I can set a breakpoint up here and we can see that uh, it's set at the process level. You can control and change if I wanted the whole group to stop or even an individual thread to stop, I'll keep it at process level. And my process and thread view on the side is showing um, uh, all of the different ranks and the ones uh, the ones that are sit at a breakpoint, it's a special breakpoint for our total view at this point that has gained control of everything. So let's just run and see how it all looks. Okay, so we've gone through and we have stopped this rank here in my status bar. I can see it's rank zero, thread one has stopped and hit that breakpoint at the, the line that I set there. And I have four other ranks. If I double click on those and refocus, they are all sitting at the same place, just as I would expect on there. Um, I mentioned earlier, different views of how I can look at the aggregated data. Um, and I can click on view number two here. And this one, I can configure my own way of doing aggregation. So if I wanted to just look at um, you know, without source information and just thread state on here, and maybe I don't care about share group, then it will do an aggregation there of which threads are running, which ones are stopped, and which ones are at breakpoint. And of course, if there were any at an error state, you would see those as well. And then I can flip back to my previous view as well on here to um, understand uh, where things are at in my process and everything. Okay. Um, so there's, um, uh, let me think through on here, what else am I gonna demo? So we've demonstrated, again, I'm running on my Mac in Massachusetts, I've connected out to uh, the head the login node on Cori. And then from there, I issued a S batch command to run my parallel job. And when that was accepted using reverse connect, it established and tied that whole debugging session together. And I'm able to do the debugging remotely now of everything here. So now I can let things run and we'll hit that breakpoint again. So I can disable that breakpoint and let everything go through on here. And then eventually, uh, once all the prime numbers and everything are uh, computed, the job will run um, out there. Total view, I think we'll still kind of hold on to the S run. Um, no, actually this time it all cleaned out correctly on here. So S run is finished, it's not there anymore. And um, if I wanted to, within the same total view session, uh, start up a new debug session, one of the things I have to do uh, is tell total view to start listening for reverse connections again. Um, one of the reasons for this is that once a session is loaded, we don't want you to have to keep getting interrupted to, do you want to accept this connection coming in? Um, and TotalView right now still has that lingering, the old session from the S run here. 
even though we won't relaunch that on that, if I submitted another batch job on here, I just simply need to change this toggle to say, start listening again for uh, re reverse connections. And then I could issue another S batch here if I wanted to. Now, the other thing I can do, uh, so let me launch and let's actually allocate, um, I think I can do it this way, which is, the command so it's using the last couple of days. So let me allocate a direct node that I can work on. Let's see, hopefully it doesn't take too long to get the resources. Might need to do the other reservation that Wusun gave earlier today to see if that'll work. Yeah, you can you can try that um, the command I suggested here. Let me just copy it here. See if that'll work. Running hosler, right? And run yeah, something like that. Let me try that. Yeah, I think is that the one I issued here? Dash N1. About you, so interactive. And uh, maybe two hours because the it will expire in yeah, 12 30. Mm -hmm. Maybe at 90 minutes or something. Yeah, I have two hours on here. I don't know if that will cause it and take it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because uh, the reservation will stop at the twelve thirty. So can you can you change the time to sixty? Yep. Yeah. Okay, one second. Let me gain, regain control. So change it to sixty sec sixty minutes. Yeah, one hour. So will that work? Yeah, I guess so. And interactive is still right. Everything yeah. Else is right. So let's try that. No, the the uh, instead of vendor use an intern. Ah, okay. All right. Anyway, you got you got a job already. Right <laughs> yeah, it started to give it to me, but uh, you're right. I didn't change that and part in there, so I want to use an intern. Okay, good. So, uh, no, relinquishing is revoked. Uh, unable to find it. I mistyped that last part. Is it TB? Yeah, double dash, yeah. dash, dash reservation. Ah, okay. It's okay. Double dash. Okay. Thank you. No. Reservation. Looking at what you typed, equals TV underscore res. I spelled it right. Let me just try your command here that you pasted in. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, so now we get onto a node. Okay, so now that I'm on a node here, I can do interactive debugging. I own this for a while. Um, I can go up to some of the labs. So here's all the labs and I've compiled the programs uh, for the systems here. And I can use the TV connect command, just the same here to debug any of these programs. So uh, Dean had shown earlier the replay engine demo. So let's try this. And now total view will get notified. Do you want to accept the job? And now here's my source uh, and I can turn on reverse debugging and I can start going through and debugging this application just the same on here and stepping in and everything. So um, 
uh, and everything's all just within now in the node on there. It's very easy. Um, it's a very easy workflow I've found now that I have Total View running locally and I can just use TV Connect to launch my job, whether it's a parallel job. Um, so I can go through and kill this now. And if I wanted to go back, let's close the TV Connect connection. And uh, I'm gonna go back to my prime example here. And if I, uh, and I wanna show this command here because this is sometimes the tricky part that can throw people. So again, I'm gonna run TV Connect. So instead of using the batch system to start my prime count example here, I'm gonna just do it by doing TV Connect and run S run directly. But you'll see what I'm doing here is I say, which S run? Because what I want to use is the full path to S run. That way there as TV Connect launches and the different mechanisms are going in building up the debug connection is it gets the right S run in the environment there. And, and then the same, I don't think this one is needed as much. I think the, it will find prime count correctly, but I put a PWD in front of it just so it does that full path on that. So now as I do a DV connect on here and do the S run, um, I do have to go back and tell Total View to start listening for connections again. And then here comes my S run. And just like before, I can then start running everything starts to launch, I'm going to stop the job before things get um, underway and I can set breakpoints. Just give a moment for everything to establish. Good, here's my source for my application. And just like before, I can set a breakpoint on line 20 and run the application. And now again, all my ranks are here sitting. So I've got a very convenient way on my dedicated node to do uh, relaunching of my parallel job, debugging, see what's going on, fix things, recompile and so forth. Okay, and if I'm done with this, I can kill the job and all the processes and go back over. TV Connect kind of holds on. It's one of the things I want to check there. I think because of the connection it has with Total View, I just control C that to say the TV Connect, you're done. And Total View then cleans up because it goes away at that point. So, and then you can just start um, another debugging session on that. So, um, I've kind of combined a lot with showing OpenMP and MPI on there. Um, any questions about doing this? Does this does this workflow seem like something that would um, enable you to run your jobs, debug your jobs within the Cori environment easier? Uh, I, see, I see a question on the chat about OpenMP examples there. Um, I don't think we ship any OpenMP examples in that examples directory. But the tutorial does have an OpenMP, um, one or two OpenMP examples in there that you'll be able to compile and follow through the um, tutorial sessions there. Okay, I've seen a, a various chatter around. Dean, is there anything else that um, we need to address from the chat side? I don't think so. No, I think it's, I think we're good. Okay. okay. All right. So if there's no other questions there, um, at the end of the presentation, Dean and I have a couple slides that we go through just some usage hints and, and areas that, that are just good to remember, sometimes can trip users up. I have a dedicated slide that will re uh, iterate some of the areas that have gone over here in using the remote UI and reverse connect um, as part of a session and just different things to keep in mind. So uh, we will hit this again. And like I said, the um, I will send a refresh slide deck to Wusun so that he can provide that to everybody. So I think next is moving on to memory debugging and Dean, you're gonna take over the share again. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, let's 
Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen, which should say memory debugging with memory escape. Yes, I can see it, Dean. Okay, so memory escape. Um, it's lightweight, intuitive, collaborative, and provides heap memory debugging features. So it shows memory errors, it can show memory status, memory leaks, and buffer overflows. You can do MPI memory debugging and remote memory debugging as well. So when we're talking about a memory debug, what are we actually referring to? Well, obviously a memory leak is a failure to free memory correctly. Um, we can also have dangling references, so failure to clear pointers, failing to check for error conditions, and memory corruption. So writing to memory that uh, you haven't allocated or overrunning the bounds of arrays. So the heat memory is managed by uh, in the, in the C language, malloc and free, and C++, new and delete, and in Fortran 90, it's allocatable arrays. And here's an example of using malloc um, to allocate some memory and then free to free that memory. So the way that um, memory scape works is we have something called the heap interposition agent, and that sits in between the your user code and libraries and the malloc API. So every time there's a memory allocation or a memory deallocation, TotalView um, records this. So it knows about all of the uh, memory allocations and deallocations and that way it can make sure that um, they match up correctly. So some of the advantages of using TotalView heap interposition agent is you can use it with your existing builds of your applications. You don't need to instrument your code in any way. All you need is a debug build of your application. And applications run, um, but it, it really depends on your particular application, but there's very low performance overhead. And the way that memory scape works is it's very efficient in its memory usage. So some of the features of memory scape, we can automatically detect allocation problems. We have memory corruption detection. There's two different techniques and we'll look at those in a bit more detail. Um, guard blocks and red zones. We can do leak detection. Um, and if you're using the classic user interface, we have dangling pointer detection. So if you, um, dive on a pointer and uh, it's not pointing to a valid memory uh, location, TotalView will flag that up as a dangling pointer. We can also view the heap graphically and uh, we can do um, a technique called memory holding, which is holding onto memory, which would otherwise be released back to the memory management system. And we can also do comparisons between processes and also different runs of your application as well. You can compare memory usage. So this is what we're talking about, about um, a memory leak and a dangling pointer. So normally when you allocate memory and you have a pointer, you have a pointer to that memory location. Um, if uh, you delete the pointer, but without failing to free the memory, then you have a memory leak. And if you have a pointer that isn't pointing to a valid memory location, then that's a dangling pointer. So just so that we're all um, on the same terminology. So memory uh, scape has several different debugging options. When you start memory scape, you can choose the level of memory debugging. So you can choose low, medium, high, or extreme. So low um, will turn on event notifications and leak detection. So low has the best performance. Medium adds um, corrupted memory detection with guard blocks. Um, high 
turns on um, corrupted memory detection with red zones, and extreme is all of the above options. And what we recommend is that um, if you want to do memory debugging of a particular application, you start off with the low option first and then gradually move up through the different levels. So you don't just immediately turn on extreme and see what happens. So start off with the lowest level first and then uh, gradually move through the options. And we also have um, advanced memory debugging options as well. So you can control things like um, the amount of um, what size memory allocations red zones um, are applied to and uh, the pattern that's used as well. So guard blocks are um, lightweight patterns that are written around a memory allocation, typically eight bytes. And you can see here, this is the uh, pre-guard pattern and the post-guard pattern. And they'll be written around uh, your memory allocations. And guard blocks will alert you to, um, here's an example of guard, bo guard blocks. Um, you can see here in this particular example, we have a, a corrupted guard block. Um, we can see that because the, the guard block in the center, um, the post guard is colored orange. So that's immediately flagging us up to the fact that the guard block has been corrupted. Normally guard blocks would be green, as you can see around this block here on the left, we've got a green um, hash around the allocated memory. So red zones um, are similar to guard blocks in that they give you um, array buffer overrun um, detection, but red zones use a whole page of memory, whereas guard blocks um, are very lightweight. But red zones have the advantage in that they give instant array bounds detection. Typically, you would apply a red zone either before or after your memory allocation. Um, and they will also alert you immediately as well. Um, you can also um, apply controls to the full management of red zones. So you can tell um, MemoryScape what size of memory allocation you want red zones to be applied to. And that's in the advanced options. And you can also turn red zones on or off at any time during the program's execution. Um, we also have the ability to paint memory. So this is very useful if you want to yeah, examine a memory dump and you can see which uh, you can see areas of memory that are allocated and deallocated. And if you look at these patterns, then it does almost look like the word allocate and deallocate. If you look at the pattern that gets uh, written into the uh, into the memory. We also have the ability to hold memory. So this stops the memory manager from reusing memory blocks that have been freed. And this can be useful in detecting certain um, memory error scenarios. So the idea is that you hold on to memory that would otherwise have been released, thereby you know, uh, forcing your program to, to run out of memory. Um, you have the option of releasing hoarded memory when the available memory gets Gets low, which allows your program to carry on running longer. Um, the heap graphical view gives you um, an, an instant um, picture of what's happening with your heap memory. So here we can see a view of the heap and the, um, the green uh, memory allocations are the allocated memory. The gray is the deallocated memory. Um, the orange is, is hoarded and that there's no memory leak shown in this particular example, but memory leaks would be, would be shown in red. So here's an example of leak detection uh, has been turned on and we can see here at a glance um, the red showing up as the leaked memory. And also down here in the category, we can see the amount of leaked memory as well. It's 67 kilobytes of, of leaked memory. Um, so we can see that instantly. Um, as I mentioned in the classic user interface, if you're uh, if you're diving on a pointer, you can um, total view will flag up if that's a dangling pointer. In other words, it's not pointing to a valid memory allocation, and it will flag that up by annotating it. 
and that does work in the new user interface as well. So it, it will okay. be there automatically. But uh, right. once memory debugging is there, you'll be able to see that really easily too, which is nice. All right. Thanks, Bill. Good to know. Um, we can also do memory comparisons as well. So if you're uh, debugging an MPI application, you can compare um, the memory usage of different uh, ranks. And so you can, for example, see if one rank is using uh, more memory than uh, the other ranks, and that immediately would um, lead to more investigation. Um, also, you can do memory comparisons between different runs of your application. So at any point during memory debugging, you can save the memory status. And then um, once you've made changes to your application, you can then save the memory status again and compare the two. So you can see whether your changes have caused um, an increase or a decrease in memory usage, which is very useful. So here's an example of looking at uh, an MPI application. Uh, we can see all of the all of the ranks, and rank zero is using slightly more memory than the other ranks. So that may be something that you'd want to look into. And we also have lots of different memory reports. Um, these can be saved typically as uh, HTML files, and you can share these with other users as well. So um, the reports are available for, for saving. They're typically HTML or, or text-based reports. And Total View and MemoryScape work together. So if you um, want to debug an application from Total View, you can just, uh, if you're using the classic user interface, you can turn on memory debugging, which is just a checkbox when you start um, debugging. And then from within Total View, you can launch MemoryScape. And conversely, if you're debugging um, an application with MemoryScape, you can also switch into Total View as well. So um, the two work very nicely together. And as Bill mentioned, we're going to be introducing uh, memory leak detection into the new Total View user interface next year. So you'll be able to start using MemoryScape features with the new user interface. Um, from the new user interface pretty soon. Um, some strategies around memory debugging in parallel. Um, run the application and see if the memory events are detected. View the memory usage across the MPI job. That was, as I mentioned, compare the different memory footprints of the uh, processes. Are there any outliers? Do you see some ranks using more memory than others? Is this expected? Um, and then gather all the information in all the processes of the MPI job and um, select and examine them and compare with the diff mechanism. Okay, so let's have a look at a MemoryScape demo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to run MemoryScape standalone so I'm going to, the command to run MemoryScape is memscape. <clears throat> and this is the MemoryScape user interface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new program. And this is a program that I've debugged before. It's, it's actually one of the examples that you have in uh, the training lab packages. So I'm going to choose the application called filter app. I'm going to select. Next, and now I get to choose the level of debugging options. So as I mentioned, low provides leak detection, medium turns on guard blocks, um, high is red zones and extreme is everything. So we're gonna turn on, for this example, we're gonna turn on guard blocks. So medium is fine for our usage. And if I just come over here to the advanced options, if I click on advanced options, we can have a look to see what's available here. Um, we can. From this button here, we can choose which of the memory events actually uh, are enabled and disabled. So things like a double free event, um, guard corruption error, we can turn these on, on or off if we need to. The default is to enable everything, but we can turn on individual events uh, on or off if we want. Um, halt execution at the process exit. Um, guard allocated memory. Here you can choose the pre-guard and the post-guard pattern and also the size of guard blocks. 
Um, if I was to turn on red zones, then we can choose whether red zones um, are applied as an overrun or an underrun or both. And we can also restrict the range as well. So here we have the option of restricting which um, the, the lower and the upper limit of memory allocations that red zones are applied to. So um, for instance, you could um, set a lower limit um, so that memory uh, red zones aren't applied to every memory allocation, but only the larger memory allocations. And we can also paint the memory. Here's the option for painting the memory and holding the deallocated memory as well. So these are the other options that we have. So let me go back to the basic options. I'm gonna leave uh, the medium level selected, um, move on to the next section. And now I'm going to just run the program to collect the memory data. So memory scape stops and it tells us that there's an error has been detected. It's saying the program has attempted to free an already freed block. And we can see down here in the bottom corner, here's the process. This is a single process application. If it was um, a multi -process, multiple process application, an MPI application, all of the processes would be listed down here on the bottom left. Um, and I could choose an individual process. So you have the option of report by process or report by event. As it's a single process, it doesn't really matter which of these I choose. So, uh, the event is a double free event. It's telling us that the program has attempted to free an already free block of memory. And if we have a look here, we can see that um, actually at line 80, MemoryScape um, is telling us that there's a call to a free um, memory here, the memory that was allocated to the variable P. Um, the allocation location occurs at line 60, and then another deallocation occurs here at line 69. So the memory that we're allocating at line 60, we're, we're freeing in two different uh, places. We're freeing it here at line 80, and we're also freeing it again at line 69. So that's obviously incorrect. We can't, we can't free memory that we've um, twice that we've allocated once. So what I'm now going to do is if I go up to um, my uh, toolbar, I can open up uh, TotalView, as I mentioned, you can launch TotalView directly from within MemoryScape. And um, this is the classic user interface, as you can tell. So what I need to do is, in order to be able to continue with this particular evaluation, I need to just get around this um, second call to free. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create an eval point here. So here's an evaluation breakpoint. What I want to do is I want to just jump over that particular call to free because I don't want that to happen. So I'm just going to set a go to and I'm going to say go to line 84, which is the end of this closing brace so that I don't want to uh, have this free uh, event called again, because otherwise we'll get stuck here and we won't be able to process for the evaluation. So once I've done that, then I can click on restart. And if I just minimize this window, um, MemoryScape advises us of another problem. So it's now telling us about a guard corruption error. It's telling us that the guard area around a block has been overwritten. So if I have a look at the block details, I can see here that the pre guard is fine, and that's a, a green hash. Um, the post guard, however, is colored orange. So that immediately tells me that something's wrong. And if I hover over that, I can see that it's been corrupted. And if we scroll down and have a look at the actual data itself, we can see that the pattern should be uh, nine nine. Actually, the first four bytes have been overwritten here. So we can see that they're zeros. So <clears throat> MemoryScape has actually picked up that something has overwritten the guard block. If I close this, if I have a look, want to have a look in more detail, I can go up to the memory reports. I can select um, what I want is a memory corruption report because that's what's happened. And here, um, MemoryScape shows me the six corrupted blocks of memory. And it also shows me the um, original source, so where the memory was allocated. It also shows me the preceding blocks as well and the following blocks, because these may have useful information. So 
So both the preceding block, the corrupted block and the following blocks of data are shown along with the source where the memory was originally allocated. So that's the second problem that we've detected. So the first was the double free event. The second is the memory corruption event. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to um, export the memory data because we can use this um, at the end. So if I click on export memory data, it's gonna save it as a specific file type. So this is the file type. And I'm just going to save that in my home directory. I'm just going to click on export. Now, if we go back to the home screen, um, what I can do is I can carry on with this debugging session by clicking on start. And MemoryScape will run until the end of the program. And if it doesn't detect any more errors, it will say to us, OK, the program's about to exit. Now's a really good time to do any last minute memory uh, checking your program is about to exit. So you should have clear, cleared up all your memory allocations. And once we get to that point, we can do things like we can view the heap, we can have a look at the memory data, we can have a look for any memory leaks. So here we can see event the process is about to exit, you can view the memory data. So let's have a look at the heap status. So the, the report I want to view is the heap status report. And we have a number of options here, but let's have a look at the heap graphical report. So MemoryScape goes away and it builds the report for us. And this is what we meant um, when we said earlier about it being very conservative in its usage of memory. So it's only builds the reports when you actually ask it to. So now it's building its report, and then it will display the heap uh, for us. And we can start to see what's happening with the, the memory usage in this particular application. So here we can see at a glance um, the memory allocations and deallocations. And I can zoom in and I can zoom out as I need to. I can focus on a particular block of data and uh, MemoryScape gives me information about that particular block, the size, the start address, the end address, the type, the pre-guard and the post-guard. I can also view over here on the left, I can see that um, the allocation is 25 megabytes, corrupted guard blocks, deallocated and guard blocks and hoarded memory, et cetera. And if I want to have a look at the other corrupted blocks, that's easy to do. I can just select that from this drop down box here, and then I can move through the heat memory, and MemoryScape shows me the other corrupted blocks. Um, if I want to reset at any time, I can just click on reset zoom as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on leak detection and MemoryScape is going to go away and check for any memory that's um, still allocated that doesn't have a valid pointer to it. So basically we're about to exit from the application. We should have cleaned up the memory. We can see that in fact, we've got um, 25 megabytes of leaked memory. You can see here, there's quite a lot from, uh, from the heap graphical view. So if we want to have a look at that in more detail, if we go up to the memory reports and we want to have a look at leak detection, one of the reports is called a source report. So if I click on that, I focus on the largest block of leaked memory, which is in my class B, and I can drill down into that and I can see that at line 49, we're leaking uh, 19 megabytes of memory. So MemoryScape has taken us right to the actual scene of the crime here where most of the memory is being leaked. That's uh, a very nice feature. So if I go back to the home screen, um, another thing to show you is the memory uh, comparison. So if you remember, um, after the second error, I exported the memory um, status, to the memory debugging file. So what I want to do now is I can add that memory debugging file back in. So if I click on browse, here's the memory debugging file I saved to disk. I can open that up. And we can now analyze that. So we can do a memory comparison. So here's the memory that I saved to disk and here's the current running process. If we do, if we click on compare, now we can compare the allocations, so we can see the difference in bytes between memory allocations. We can see the difference in deallocations, and we can see the difference in leaked memory as well. 
But what's also quite nice is we can have a look at the memory usage and there's a chart report. And if I go over here to um, the options, we can see we've got a bar report, a stacked report, a line or a pie chart. If I have a look at the stacked report, here we can see on the left, this is the current running process. So we can see the total virtual memory, we can see the heap and we can see the text memory. And then over here on the right, we can see the file that we saved to disk earlier on. So immediately we've got a very nice visual comparison between the two. So what you could do is you could um, use this as a way of comparing MPI processes, or you could use this as a way of comparing different runs of your application. So if you save your application, and then you make changes to it, and then you want to see, well, how have my changes affect the memory usage? And then you can uh, load up the previously saved um, memory debugging file. So that's what I wanted to show you from um, memory uh, memory escape. I think the other the other interesting report is we have a high level process report, and we also have a detailed program and library report. And this is just showing uh, the memory usage of all the different libraries within the application. So you can focus on um, how much each individual library is using. The memory scape, as you can see, is a very powerful tool and uh, it has lots of capabilities. Let me come out of this. Okay, so did we get any questions about memory scape on, on the chat? Uh, let's see here. How is memory corruption happening in this case was one of the questions that came through. So in this case here, are you just uh, overwriting the bounds of a, an array or how does how do we corrupt the memory in this program? Yeah, so we're, we're allocating, we're doing an allocation and then we're overwriting the bounds of that array. Um, mm -hmm. Just overwriting the end of that array. Yep. And then memory scapes picking that up. Okay. Where are we in the presentation? Okay. So the transformations, I think we were skipping through. Um, that wasn't one of the yeah. topics for today. And I think CUDA is next. Okay. So um i can take over on that part i'll stop sharing and um yeah let me pick up the sharing so how are we doing time check here so we got about 40 minutes or so left i want to leave some time for questions at the end and if anybody has any questions about the labs or anything so it's just tough okay all right, so you should be able to see my screen okay. So I'm gonna go through some slides on CUDA. Actually, I can do a live demo um, on one of my CUDA machines here at the lab that we have too, just so we can see how uh, Total View looks debugging on a CUDA application. So like I mentioned earlier in the, um, that's not the right one, that's transformations, CUDA. There we go. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, TotalView has uh, supported uh, debugging of NVIDIA GPU accelerators for quite some time. Um, we support up through um, the latest set of uh, uh, physical hardware for the GPUs. We're validating on the latest A100 amperes uh, now. Um, I have one in-house just doing the final setup, one of our systems. And uh, we keep up to date aggressively on the latest releases of uh, CUDA from NVIDIA as well. Uh, there's a number of capabilities that are supported through TotalView if you're using dynamic parallelism, uh, support for that. If you're using uh, GPUs across your MPI cluster and especially in a multi, uh, multi GPU per node type of configuration, uh, TotalView has uh, got support there for, for debugging on those different GPUs. Uh, one of the advances that you will see uh, coming next year is that same level of aggregation that you see at the process and thread level um, is gonna be applied in, to debugging all across GPUs, especially in a multi-GPU case. 
of course, when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of threads across lanes and warps and so forth on, forth on a GPU, it can be tough to understand what is happening with your code as it's executing. So to help with that, we're going to be applying different ways of doing aggregation, enabling you to do different queries of uh, the um, state of the code on the GPU. So watch for that coming uh, next year and uh, it just further advances to support CUDA development. Uh, as you see when, when we look at some of the screenshots and I, and I bring up um, uh, total view and debugging in NVIDIA GPUs, you can look at things in a physical fashion or in a logical fashion of we have ways to control the navigation across the different aspects of looking at the GPUs in that way and the state of the code running on them. And uh, inside of a GPU, uh, there's memory checking that goes on. And if any events that are raised out of that through CUDA memcheck, TotalView can uh, capture those events and show you where memory faults are detected by the GPU. Now, the TotalView uh, model on that when, when we look at code that's running on a, on a kernel and just the way that code starts up and is executed. So of course, we'll start from a host processor, the CPU on the system, and it'll kind of bootstrap the application that may be code that runs over there and then it'll launch code out on the kernels. Now, TotalView um, does not know what that code is gonna look like until uh, it is, um, uh, until it is executed and loaded and executed onto the, the kernel. And that can create a challenge as far as setting breakpoints. Um, it's similar to, if you think back when we talked about the Python demo, when Python loads a module, it does it purely dynamically and TotalView won't know enough about it to really know where to set breakpoints until the code is physically loaded and a GPU, uh, code running on a GPU kernel is the same. So we'll see how you can set your breakpoints in a fashion in that code before it's even launched on the GPU. So it makes a nice clean workflow. And uh, there's a whole hierarchy of how the memory is organized uh, through the GPU. And you'll see annotations on TotalView as you look at variables. So you'll see if um, a variable is, uh, it'll have an annotation if it's global or local or parameter types of data. And um, so that's a different, just a different way that TotalView will highlight the data um, that you're looking at that's running out on the GPU. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, as code is running out there, um, they are run, uh, and, and a lot of this is specific to the NVIDIA uh, GPU architecture. Um, warps are advanced synchronously across, and they share a PC on there. So there, TotalView has a fairly high level view of what you can do. And, and one of the implications of that is when you run to a particular line, you're gonna move a lot of code that's going across those warps to that line. Um, there isn't really individual control, as you might think of individual threads running in a program and you can step that thread and the other threads stay where they're at and they can diverge. Um, it's, a, it's a bit different behavior when running on a GPU. So you have to keep that in mind as you're debugging your code across, um, across a kernel. We have some notes in here. I won't go through all these details. Um, you probably know a lot of this on just specific for your environment or how to, um, how to debug it, uh, set up your application for debugging and so forth. I'm gonna actually demonstrate this TX CUDA MATMOL um, application in a moment here. And uh, we just have some notes there on what you might need to do for the different style of GPU to take advantages of the advanced features of, um, of, the, of the GPU. And then you know, finally here, it's really when the application's built and ready to go, it's just running TotalView against the application. There's nothing else you need to do. TotalView will dynamically detect that CUDA is on the system. Your application is using CUDA to, um, to launch code out onto it and then will reconfigure itself as it moves, uh, as it goes through and starts up a double, uh, enabling debugging. So uh, these screenshots are kind of blurry. So I'm gonna move ahead and actually, um, I think I'm gonna move into the live demo on here. I can show off some of these other features in the program elements. 
place window we're going to skip over because that is going to go away. And then the memory checker part um, we have. So actually, let me let me actually switch over to a um, uh, a VNC window that I have. So um, here uh, I'm logged into a system that is in my data center in Colorado, and um, it has I think. Pascal, this may have a Pascal. We have Pascal, uh, Volta, and um, Tesla GPUs. Um, this actually might be a Volta on this system here. But I'm going to run TotalView 2020.3 and load that to your CUDA map mall. So, literally from the command line, we'll do that and load the application. Okay, so a couple things I'll point out in the source here. Here is main. This is where CPU code would start running and going through and executing. But quickly, uh, above at the TARDIS top of this program, um, we will get into segments of code that you can see here. This one's marked as global, um, and this is going to get run on the kernel. And even though we can see all the lines and what will be run on here, total view on the left, so total view will highlight where it knows it can set a breakpoint. And because this code is run out in the kernel and it hasn't been loaded on a kernel yet, we can't actually um, know where we're, what are valid breakpoints. Like line 94 will be a valid breakpoint. I can set a breakpoint there. But what TotalView will do is put a, a hollow breakpoint marker there to indicate to say, okay, I understand you want to set a breakpoint here. I don't know the actual location of it yet, but I will try to resolve it once this gets loaded out onto a kernel. So it kind of will remember that. And what you will see is further down at the bottom of this code unit for the kernel is it will plant a secondary breakpoint. And this just happens to be what we call sliding down to find an actual location of where we could plant that breakpoint. So what will happen when your code gets loaded onto a kernel is it will resolve at line uh, 94 on here, the uh, that it can plant a breakpoint here, and it will then slide back up this other location. So it seems a little complicated, but you know that's the world that Tolby knows about at this point. It only knows what it's given for information at the start of loading this program, um, and it will discover more as this code is low, is launched and out onto the kernel out here. So what's nice is that I haven't had to run anything at this point. We can set the breakpoints and figure out where in my code that I want to debug on here. So um, we'll go through and I think there is another part up here. Uh, yeah, this is running up in the device as well. So I can plant another breakpoint up in this code that will get hit. So now we can start to run. Okay, so We've hit this breakpoint at line 94, and what you can see now is it's a solid, solid filled in rectangle. And that indicates that this code was loaded and uh, TotalView found where it should properly plant that breakpoint out in the kernel code on here. I am stopped within the kernel. And one of the indicators that helps me uh, know that is when I look at my thread ID, TotalView will give CUDA threads a negative thread ID index on here. So we're at process one thread ID minus one. And um, so now I know that I am in GPU code. I can look at the variables, the local variables that are over here. And we begin to see those annotations that are on those variables. So in my data view, if I wanna explore further any of these, I can drag them over. And uh, then I can begin to expand, look at the values. I can change the values on here. And uh, we see you know, at, at generic on here, the at local, using those indicators of where this uh, information ride, resides in GPU memory on there. Um, I can step through. So at this point here, I can step this code. And oh, we're going to hit our other breakpoint because as it starts to go through, we're executing more code on the, the GPU in the kernel here. And I could look at the values of those variables and I can continue stepping and so forth on here. And I think eventually we will return back throughout. 
and then we should go back up to the other routine that launched from that kernel point into here on here. So I've got full control of the stepping, look at the variables, the values. Um, if I want to change any of my blocks or threads, if I'm looking at the GPU in a logical fashion, we do put these two controls in the toolbar up here and, um, and I can move back through. I don't know how many blocks uh, or threads are configured in this application. I think it's a fairly simple application, so there may not be really um, there will be multiple threads that I think are running, but uh, in this case here, it would depend on how you configured your code to run onto the device on here. And if you want to think of things in a physical fashion here, you can change your SMs, your warps, your lanes, and so forth to look at your code as it's executing through those aspects of the, of the device. Okay. And um, so if we go and run here again, I think we'll just hit the breakpoint here at that at that code. Uh, again, I can change my attributes and how things are broken down and, uh, and and aggregated in my display. And if I want to go back to host code at any point, uh, let's see which thread was actually on that host. Probably 1.3. I'm not sure which thread was on the host, but I could get back into the host code as well at some point. So we'll, we'll jump back over to the GPU here. Uh, so I will also note that, um, unfortunately, reverse debugging reverse debugging doesn't work on a GPU, so it will it will not record what happens on the GPU. But if you do enable reverse debugging on the CPU side, it will record everything that happens there. And so that could be helpful if you needed to debug um, reverse debug how your data may have been set up before it launched over to a GPU. Okay. Um, so let me flip back over to the slides. I think that is it. Yeah, that's just a animated graphic that goes through. Okay. Um, so any questions on GPU debugging before we move on? There's a question on the chat, Bill. It's about large scale complex application debugging. I'm not sure if it's GPU specific, but it's about long running applications. I was thinking about maybe using TV scripts to kind of catch some of the errors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So yeah, if you wanna go ahead and, and talk about that for a second, Dean, um, I can actually flip to, we can just take a moment here. So we're doing okay on time. Um, so let me, we won't go through a full thing in here, but if you just wanna talk about what TV script is and how it could be yeah. used in this case. <laughs> Sure. So, so with uh, TotalView, we have the option of running it in batch or unattended uh, mode, which basically all of the TV, all of the TotalView commands you can run from TV scripts. So you could create a script to, to run your application, and then you could say within the script, um, if any particular error occurs, then do the following. And the following could be you want to write out the, um, the the call stack, the values of particular variables. You could you could print out. You could you could save the memory debugging file, which we saw earlier. You could save that to disk. There's various different things that you could do from from TV script. So TV script has got it's very powerful. It's based on the um, TCL programming language. So basically, you can uh, create create a, a script that runs your application. And then you can just let it run and, and, and leave it. And what will happen is you'll get two different log files. You'll get a, a summary log file, which tells you what, um, what has happened. For example, it's, it's hit this breakpoint or it's encountered this error and it's done this action. And you'll also get the log file, which gives you all of the information that you've requested. So yeah, I would, I would suggest maybe TV script could be one approach to using, to, to tackling those kind of issues. Right, right. Okay, hopefully that helps on there. So uh, there is decent documentation about TV script and how you can um, use it like uh, Gene, Dean describes on there. And, and, and that's a great case on there where you could have a large job run it on a TV script. And if it were to crash on there, it's going to save off the core file. If you're running under reverse debugging, you can instruct it to save a, a recording file and any other information there to help you in a, in a post-mortem way, try to reconstruct what may have happened for, with your application. And, All right, and one, of the, one of the labs covers TV script as well. So you can have a look at the, the lab 
Um, but if you, you know, you have any questions about how to create a, a script, um, have a look in the have a look in the reference guide because you've got the user guide and then the reference guide and the reference guide has got the information about TV script. But also, you know, we can help with that as well. And, then, and there's a question about uh, GPU Direct. Is Total View support or work with GPU Direct? So, um, I don't. G GPU Direct is a way for the GPUs to um, very easily access uh, data that is um, uh, being accessed through either network adapters, storage drives, or other locations. So you don't have to move as much data um, onto GPUs and so forth there. Now, um, I need to try some explicit programs to before I can say conclusively if it will work with it or not. I believe with the GPU Direct, they're just additional directives like we saw um, for accessing data that way. And it just goes out through um, to access the data directly on either the uh, through memory or storage drives on there. Um, so I, I'll have to get back to you on a, a more definitive answer of if will it work with the GPU Direct or not. Okay, so let me jump ahead and um, so I can, um, that covers actually most of what the agenda we we're going to cover today. The last couple sections um, was to um, talk a bit about uh, um, with the um, uh, total view roadmap, kind of what we're looking at for, for next year. Um, and, uh, and then Dean and I wanted to go through a few of the slides of the uh, common um, uh, areas that uh, developers may have either um, some questions about with total view or um, sometimes things that can trip uh, that can trip up um, a developer as they're going through and they're new to you know different parts of, of total view so um, so here um, this is where we've come from through 2020. We've had, uh, we totally view does four releases a year. And um, you can see the progression through of different features that we've incorporated, including this latest release in June. It includes that remote UI capability that we saw today, the OpenMP5 support. Um, uh, I will note, uh, I don't, uh, for uh, anybody who are students at your organization or you know of students that could use the power of total view, we have a, a very friendly student license that they can apply for um, and get a license for for free for that. And um, uh, we've enhanced its capabilities this year to allow them to uh, use the full power of Total View and everything. So it's great to have that offering for students as well. So um, looking into next year, you'll see common themes that kind of run through. Uh, we are, like I said, aggressively keeping up with NVIDIA as they're moving really fast. And um, uh, so we'll be continuing to add support for their latest GPUs and CUDA advances and other technologies there. Um, so you'll see that in our progression of four releases for next year that are planned uh, for users that use Mac OS. Um, uh, I know that the community generally keeps up very quickly to the latest version. So we plan to add Big Sur support in our February release. That'll be the first release of the year. Um, initially, things were looking okay, but some of the bundling uh, that they've done, uh, because they are preparing to have uh, dual bundling support of x86 and ARM as they move their architecture over to ARM. So um, that does impact the, the, the debugger, of course, and what um, it has to do to load debug information. So we have to uh, incorporate some of that into the debugger. Uh, we saw today with the OpenMP and, and um, uh, navigating between threads and so forth, sometimes you know it can be confusing on where I came from and you may want to get back to a particular starting point. So we'll be incorporating a feature called like a dive stack. And as you either go through threads that have called each other or you go through functions or anything like that, much the same as you click through links on a browser, you'll be able to return to previous ones more easily. So um, that'll be a feature that's coming. We've talked about the memory debugging, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to incorporating uh, memory debugging into the new user interface. We'll begin with leak detection and looking at the overall state of the heap. Um, and then through subsequent releases of the year, we'll be adding into um, the ability to export memory data, uh, compare memory data, look at buffer overruns and all the features that, uh, that Dean talked about today as well. Uh, I want to incorporate uh, array 
uh, 2D and 3D eventually array visualization and other types of data visualization in the product. A number of users said uh, it, it's very advantageous to look at their data that way as they're debugging it. And building on that as well as improving our array debugging support, allowing you to slice and stride um, a, um, a, uh, a, a portion of your data so you can focus on what you would like to see um, and filter that data as well. Um, and then going later into the year, uh, we don't have assembly view yet into the new user interface. And as you start to get to more advanced code, often you do need to get down to the instruction level and look at what's happening as data is moving across registers and through different instructions. So that'll be coming across. Um, uh, and then some advancements we want to do to continue to invest in reverse debugging and um, allow you to more easily navigate across that timeline and uh, see events that happen uh, across there as well. Uh, and we mentioned some of the other areas such as um, incorpor incorporating subset attach, uh, better data aggregation. Um, I have some improvements that I wanna make on, TV, on that TV script technology that we just talked about there. Um, it's very powerful to be able to drive the debugger in a script-like way, uh, not only for running in a cluster, but I have a lot of customers who are doing DevOps and working in uh, a continuous integration environment and running under the debugger, say within Jenkins can be advantageous to capture the results and a failed test and everything and, and uh, show that uh, to developers when they come back and revisit a failure. Um, so still a lot going on on there. Um, one of the things that really helps us is any feedback as, as you use the product. Um, features that you wish were there, features you have problems with, um, anything there, you know, we want to make sure the product um, is doing what the, the best it can for you and helping you get through issues in your code and solve whatever programmatic mission that you're working on. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk through a few of these, uh, Dean, that we've uh, compiled on here. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we talked a bit about, um, and I think there was a question that came up if you couldn't find a total V source, just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, make sure you compile with dash G. Uh, dash G is uh, what instructs the compiler to build in that debug information and tells total view where to go find source files. And if you have done that, well, maybe you've moved your application from where the source is. And to adjust total view, you can have it, um, you can specify new search paths for the source. And uh, in either UI, you can just go to the preferences dialog and then look for the search path. And you can add in new paths of where to look for source. Okay. Um, for Python debugging, uh, I talked about the issue with Conda earlier, so um, uh, that so that people should be aware of that. Um, there is uh, a level of debug information that is available um, either with Nthought or as part of system packages, and that gives the debugger the insight to what's happening to into the interpreter, and allows us to do the filtering and show you that um, integrated call stack between Python and C and C plus plus. Um, I will also note here, so anybody working on advanced, uh, latest versions of CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 7, 8, that um, Python has changed some of those internal data structures and uh, we have to have TotalView accommodate those. So if you're on one of those operating systems using that latest version of Python, um, you'll see TotalView doesn't quite do the right thing there. And um, if you check our release notes, there are some workarounds on that so that um, you can, uh, um, you can get total view to do the proper Python debugging. We'll be adding, it's basically a port that we need to do to support the new data structures that they have um, changed to in the latest version of, of Python on that version. We talked a lot uh, today about using the RDC and the remote UI. And, um, uh, and I see a question that's coming up from Michael there. I'll answer that in a second on there. And, and I do have some information for that. Um, X11 forwarding performance can be bad. Um, I don't encourage people to do an SSH-Y and try to forward a total view display. Um, X11 is just not built for rich user interfaces like total view and you will be frustrated with um, the performance, especially the new UI. Um, I'm, I'm much 
more advocate use of the remote display client or the remote UI feature um, and, um, and, and not deal with uh, problems with X11 forwarding. Uh, Michael asked a question, is there major differences in running TotalView under the Intel versus GNU compilers? For the most part, no. Um, in normal debugging, um, they both produce good debug information and TotalView can show you uh, variables, including variables in inline functions that can op often be very tricky um, and uh, will give you very good support of both compilers. Where we do see differences start to come um, about in those two compilers is when you add in a level of optimization with the bug information. So if you compile with dash G and then you say dash 01 or dash 02 or 03, and sometimes you need to do this on, on complex um, codes because you, you just need them to run as fast as that compiler will make them run. We have found that the GNU compile actually does a better job with its debug information when you begin to optimize code. And um, as you go in and out of uh, inline functions, which a lot of them will get inline by the compiler, um, uh, TotalView will be given better information to show you those variable values, values to trace through the code. You do need to just be aware that as compilers do optimize that code, it just doesn't always run in a sequence you think about it running as it goes through. That's how it optimizes it and makes it faster. It's still correct, but it's just running faster. So as you're stepping and going through your code, um, it may not fo follow a logical flow. You'll see that PC jump around as it's going between other inline functions. Um, so just keep that in mind there. It's not a problem with the debugger. It's, it's just following the instructions of what the compiler gives it. Um, the other thing you can keep in mind is compilers will be very aggressive in what they store in memory, cache memory, um, and so forth, and registers. And um, there are times that you'll look and say that variable should be in scope, why can't I see it? And it's because the compiler will optimize the variable out until it's needed at some point later in a routine. So often you may enter another block and then the variable will come in and you'll be able to see the value. And again, this is very tricky areas for any debugger to understand what's going on with the compilers there. So it's, it's a good question there. And, and as a programmer on the outside, sometimes you just don't see that inside of what these compilers are doing to make your program run as fast as possible. Dean went through uh, all the different total view action points and ways to use those um, and, um, uh, and use of watch points. Um, so one thing that is really neat is watch points can be used to watch memory and when it changes, it will halt the program on there. Keep in mind, if you watch a local variable, a local variable is on the stack. And when you exit a function on there, that stack is going to change, which will trigger the watch point. TotalView will give you a warning to say, you're watching memory that's on a stack. So you're aware of that. It doesn't prevent you from doing it, but it's just something to keep in mind. It's just, again, it's some of those internals that creep into what you have to think about as a developer. And you know, it's not always pleasant, but when you get down to the lower levels of what the compilers do and what the debuggers have to deal with, sometimes you just need to have some of that understanding so you can still effectively debug your application. Uh, let's see, variables and scope and focus. Um, Oh yes. Um, so by default, when total view hits a breakpoint for a thread, it will change the focus to that thread. Um, this actually, this default changed a, a while ago, but it is something that you can control in total view. And if you find that total view is annoying because it keeps flipping to the thread that hits a breakpoint and you're focused on some other code, you can tell total view to not do that automatic switch. And uh, so that's just um, depending on how you uh, prefer or the characteristics of your application you may change that preference. We talked about MPI in this first one here of the different ways to launch. If you want maximum performance, launch like you normally would do on a command line or through a batch queue and then hook TotalView into that process with the TV, TV connect or have TotalView launch there. On the reverse debugging side, um, we um, talked through uh, some of the, uh, we hit on a few of the ways there that you can um, control the characteristics. So reverse debugging is recording the execution of your program. It uses a circular buffer 
um, to store that history. And when it fills, it will age out the old recorded history and replace it with new history. Um, you can control the size of that buffer if you find it's recording too much for your application. And um, so that can help you control the amount of resources it uses. The other thing you can do, like I mentioned earlier, is don't turn on reverse debugging until you're close to the point that you want to actually begin recording. And uh, so I'll typically set a breakpoint at some point later during my execution. And at that point, I'll turn on reverse debugging and then let it run. Um, so everything beforehand is running full speed. And then I'll take the penalty of uh, doing the reverse debugging after that. Dean talked through a lot of these points on memory debugging here. Um, uh, so one of the things, don't turn on all the options, progressively work up through and try to find the issues there because the more options you turn on, the more impact it's going to have on the performance of your application, the resources it takes on there. We've uh, talked about the new UI and the classic UI, how to switch between them. And hopefully we've done a pretty good job of identifying where the gaps still are in functionality. So there's no surprises there. Um, the reverse connect feature, we use that a lot today. That TV connect is really powerful. Um, one of the things that I've noted and, and I've got a, um, an enhancement request for my team to improve on this is, um, if you'll remember, I, I used the PWD command, which gives you the full path before uh, where, you, where you currently are to run an executable. And I do that so that I fully define the whole path to my program that is going to be passed to TV Connect. And the reason for that is, is sometimes under some circumstances, TV Connect can't find it as it goes through this launch sequence. And it gives out an obscure message that says something about incompatible execution file format for the target. And it's not quite right. Um, it can happen, but most times it means I can't find your program. So, um, so the easiest way to solve this is to provide the full path to your program. So in the second bullet here, I show changing um, to use the full path to my program that I'm to use with TV Connect. And that should alleviate that problem. And then, of course, there's a lot of other helpful hints. If you go up to totalview.io, um, our help system is there. And um, we have a whole set of video tutorials that are organized into classes and tracks. And uh, much of what Dean and I showed today, you can just watch short four or five minute snippets of that functionality there to help refresh how to use a particular feature and so forth. And then, um, uh, the NERSC environment is, um, this was actually my first real opportunity to, to work with Corey. Uh, my support team uses a lot of engineers that use on it. So um, I'm grateful to Wusun for giving me access and, and, uh, and get Total View working on there. There were a few tips that I kind of picked up uh, when going through that hopefully will help you as well. So the, for the remote UI, um, I configured the front end using this information. I just named it corey.nurse.gov. You can name it whatever you want. And then the remote host is just your username. This is no different than SSHing in. It's what you would do to SSH into the system. Um, if you don't set up your SSH keys or anything, you will be prompted at the terminal to enter your password in the OTP like I did and Dean had to do today. Um, but if you set your keys up, it will just automatically launch through, much like I did when I connected to my system in Colorado. And then make sure to give that full path to where TotalView is installed, because when we connect into that Quarry system, we're running parts of TotalView. So if we can't find it there, then we won't be able to launch. It will give you information to help you figure out what's wrong. So, um, hey Bill, can yes. you change the, uh, the version number uh, to default? instead of 2023.11? You could, yeah. If default goes to that latest okay. version all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely, that's so. That's what I'm doing. So whenever I, I got a new default version, I change that, you know, create a soft link. Yep. So the user, I mean, it is a total view that default, not default. Okay, all right, so total view dot default. Yeah, same thing with the memory, memscape. Okay, all right, so that's good. So you can just use totalview.default then, and, um, and that's good because then you don't need to change it as new versions of TotalView are put out there. Right, exactly. 
Okay. And um, so an enhancement that we will be adding to this process is to allow you to run uh, a script before um, you do the setup and, and so forth out there. Uh, one of the things that I found I did in my bash profile extension was I did a module load total view. Um, so that set up the, to the total view environment there. So um, I'm hoping for February, it, it should be a fairly simple enhancement that will allow you to run a script that could do say module load total view, module load open MPI, whatever it is that you need to commonly set up for this configuration. Uh, keep in mind, you can have as many configurations as you want. So if you connect and you have a target application that's using Intel and open MPI and other technologies, well, you can have it run a script that does all that. And then you can set up a second one that maybe sets up your environment differently for another application, but it's still connecting to Cori, but it's just setting it up for that application. Um, and that will help you there. Yeah, so about that, the, uh, the I create a remote init script, which loads the total view. Mm -hmm. So you know the uh, you know remote display client setting, if you click the advanced option there, you should have put that the uh, the full path for that uh, script, right? For the RDC, and right. we want to have something similar here for the remote UI too. Or you don't have a, that kind of thing for the remote. Not UI? yet, no, not yet. So you kind of have to set it up through your environment a little bit, which is not as ideal. But um, the next release will allow you to run that script. Okay. And, um, and then you can see how I insert the TV connect into my um, uh, Slurm script here so that um, once my remote UI is set up and I submit to the queue if I want to debug this way, then uh, once my job is run, it will establish a connection back to my total view that's all set up and going. And then lastly, if you're using a pre-allocated node, um, I ran TV connect. And again, you can see where I'm using that full path. It looks kind of weird, but which S run will give you that full path to S run. And then I do the same here on my current working directory. I have it insert that in front of prime count. This should actually have a slash there like that. Okay. And those are the patterns that I did as well today. So hopefully this helps a little bit. Um, I'm not an expert in your system yet, so there may be other things. Um, Wusun, what I would recommend is, is maybe you and I take some time to refresh some of your internal um, uh, documentation, wiki pages or whatever system you use, and we can bring some of this information there and it could be a good reference point for your users. Yeah, that'd be good, thanks. Okay, all right, so I will work with you on that. And that covers about what we wanted to go through today. Um, are there are questions that I can, Dean and I can answer or, um, uh, and I'm happy, like I said, I'm happy to, I'm gonna let Dean go if there's nothing else for him because it's getting late in his day, but um, I'm happy to stay around if people were working on the labs and had questions there as well.